Good evening, and welcome to our live webcast of Open Book, Open Mind Online with Isabel Wilkerson talking about her groundbreaking New York Times bestseller, Cast, The Origin of Our Discontents. I'm Ariel Zeitlin, one of Montclair's librarians, and here are a few housekeeping details. Whether you're using a phone, a tablet, or a computer, you have the same controls in GoToWebinar. Here's the question mark or chat box, which is your link to me and my librarian co-host, Molly Hone, during the webcast. You can use it for live tech help from Molly, and you'll also use it to send us your questions for the author Q&A at the end. Thank you, Molly. Now I'd like to introduce Gina Fort Chung, a member of the board of our Library Foundation. Welcome, Gina. Hello again, thanks, Ariel. We're so happy you're all here for another virtual webcast of Open Book, Open Mind. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the foundation. We're a group of your friends and neighbors, and our mission is to raise money to fund the offerings that make our library so special. This includes library programs like this one, staff development, building restoration, and other needs that aren't covered by city funding. Your donations support everything from laptop lending and Wi-Fi hotspots for Montclair residents without internet access, to the, to the delivery of materials to seniors who are at home, to the children's reading programs, and most recently, the significant growth in e-content during the pandemic. So please make a donation through our website, montclairplf.org, after you enjoy this event. Gifts of all sizes have an impact, and the library needs your support now more than ever. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, and thank you so much for all that you do. And for everyone in the audience, if you're looking for another way to support the library, please consider joining the Montclair Library Friends. Um, to learn more, visit our website or search Montclair Library Friends on Facebook. And now it's my pleasure and my very great honor to introduce our guest tonight, Isabel Wilkerson. Welcome, Isabel. There she is, yay. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, it's such a pleasure. Um, Isabel Wilkerson has emerged as a leading voice on the subject of race relations social justice in America and elsewhere. She is an interpreter of the human condition with an impassioned vision for how history can help us understand ourselves, our country, our world, and our current era of upheaval. As Chicago Bureau Chief of the New York Times, Isabel was the first African-American journalist to win a Pulitzer Prize for her reporting. Her first book, The Warmth of Other Suns, also a New York Times bestseller, was an outstanding chronicle of the Great Migration and won numerous prizes, including the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um, it's difficult to overestimate the influence of Isabel's latest book cast, which you can borrow from the library or buy from our partner, Watch on Bookseller here in Montclair. Cast was both a number one New York Times bestseller had an Oprah's Book Club choice, as well as Time Magazine's number one nonfiction book of the year. If I named all the best books of the year lists it made, we'd have, we'd have no time for the conversation. The Washington Post called Cast a powerful, illuminating, and heartfelt account of how hierarchy reproduces itself, as well as a call to action for the difficult work of undoing it. But I don't have to tell you how important a figure Isabel has become. Um, a thousand people signed up for this webinar, and sadly, we've had to turn more away. Isabel, we so appreciate your willingness to join us, albeit virtually. Now, I'm also very proud to introduce Isabel's conversation partner this evening, Rachel L. Swarns. Welcome, Rachel. 
Here she is. Yay. Hi. <laughs> um, Rachel Swarns is an associate professor at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. She writes about race and race relations as a contributing writer for the New York Times, where she was a reporter for many years. Um, her articles about Georgetown University's roots in slavery touched off a national conversation about American universities and their ties to this painful period of history and will be expanded into a book. Her own books, uh, her other books include American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, and Unseen, unpublished black history from the New York Times photo archives. Rachel is a longtime Montclair resident, a tireless supporter of the library, and a member of the Open Book, Open Mind Advisory Committee. I can't think of a more perfect pairing. Um, so this is the moment you have all been waiting for. I'll be back to read the questions for our audience Q&A. And for all of you at home, please remember that you can start submitting your questions while the conversation is going on. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a particular pleasure for me because I first heard about Isabel Wilkerson when I was at Howard University, the college student uh, dreaming about becoming a journalist. Uh, the chairman of Howard's journalism department, Dr. Larry Cagua, told all of us that someday, maybe, if we worked really, really hard, we might be like Isabel who worked at the New York Times. Um, of course, there's only one Isabel Wilkerson, but I share your passion for history and I've followed your career for many years now, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in your book, um, you describe cast as, and I'm going to quote you here, the wordless usher in a darkened theater guiding us to our assigned seats for a performance. You say it embeds in our bones. Uh, this unconscious ranking of human beings. But you also say that caste um, derives, a caste system derives its power from its invisibility. So I'm wondering, as someone who has long written about race and racial violence and lived race here, when you first saw caste and, and saw this as a system that needed to be explored? Well, um, Rachel, first of all, let me say how um, how delighted I am to be here with you, um, to be able to uh, share this experience, and, and also knowing that um, we're both people who spend a lot of time in the day-to-day -day of journalism and have, have migrated ourselves uh, into longer form narrative nonfiction. So it's, you know, it, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here with you. Um, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where did you see it? When did you first see it? Was what it your writing uh, Warmth of Other Sun? I mean, you've lived it, but when did you see it? Well, first of all, I want to say that I don't perceive myself as writing about race per se. I think a lot of people perceive me as doing that, and I, I don't say that I don't, but I like to say that I write about human nature. That's really what I write about. Um, so the, the course of my work, um, both at the Times and the long form, work that I'm doing now is really trying to understand what is it that's underneath the behaviors, the interlocking systems uh, of human nature that lead to so much you know, heartache, terror, violence, misunderstanding, discontent, you know, all of those things. When it comes to caste itself as an idea, um, I, I had not thought of it either. I mean, so anybody who you know gets this book and I first have to think, now wait a minute, caste is not about India and it's not about maybe feudal Europe. I mean, I didn't always think of it as, as something that was related to our country at all. But it was with The Warmth of Other Sons, the first book, that I was, you know, my job was to try to recreate that world of the Jim Crow South. What was it that these people, six million people, were defecting? What were they leaving? What were they escaping? Why would six million people uproot themselves in that way and then spread out all over the rest of the country? You know, why would they do that? And what was it that was propelling them? And so I had to recreate that world because it was narrative nonfiction, and the job is to is to make it come alive so that the readers can feel as if they are there with you, as if they're experiencing it themselves. And, uh, you know, so I, as, as 
people may know, I mean, I, I interviewed all of these people to narrow it down to the uh, three that I was going to mainly focus in on. And then talking with those, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people about their experiences in the auditioning phase of that book. You know, I heard so many experiences and people talked about the terror, people talked about fear, people talked about being in a fixed place and that they couldn't, there were so many things that they couldn't do. And there was this sense of, of anxiety, fear, and terror for doing the least things that one might imagine. So I, you know, I, you know, began to do more research and it turned out that this was a world where it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. I mean, that's how specific how detailed and how much a person would have to memorize as to what they could and couldn't do. And in further searching uh, for ways to make it come alive, I then became aware of the work of anthropologists who'd gone into the Jim Crow South during that era when it was at its, you know, at the, the, the depths of its power, you might say, in the 1930s and 40s. And they spent time living it. They spent time in the field you know they were there for months and in some cases years living within the restrictions of whatever caste they were you know whatever group they were a part of or were perceived to be part of regardless of their education or standing otherwise and you know they emerged from that work using the word caste they had studied it they were anthropologists who that was their job is to understand you know human systems uh, and they emerged using that language. And so, you know, decades later, when I discovered that that was how they were describing it, and also that was what I was hearing from the people I was interviewing, although of course they were not using the word caste, but they were describing caste-like restrictions and uh, fear and in, in some ways occupational restrictions, restrictions at every level. And, and so I began to use the word caste in The Warmth of the Sun. So that means that anybody who read The Warmth of the Suns they have been exposed to caste. It was throughout that book. And from that moment forward, I started to use the term caste whenever I would talk about the book and talk about the great migration and then talk about our country too. Okay. And you make a distinction between, oh, well, they're connected, racism, race and caste, right? Racism feels very personal. Uh, but you point out that caste is not. Caste is not about feelings or morality. It's about powers, pow about power, about resources, about who has it, who doesn't. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it helps us to understand how uh, good people, people who can condemn racism, for instance, can at the same time perpetuate uh, a caste system. That actually is a perfect way to put it because you know, we get um, caught up in language that makes people, distances people from the very thing we're trying to describe, where people at this point will say, you know, I don't have a racist bone in my body. You know, there's this, this, this automatic deflection from any potential connection to, you know, what we know to be, a, uh, you know, a, a reality in terms of behavior, in terms of assumptions about people. Cast allows us to see beneath what we otherwise might, might not be able to to name or to describe. You know, it, it doesn't mean that race and racism don't exist. It just means that there's something underneath uh, the system that we they otherwise can't see. And so I describe caste as an artificial, arbitrary, graded ranking of human value in a society. It's what determines one's standing, respect, benefit of the doubt, um, access to resources or denial of access to resources, assumptions of competence and intelligence and worthiness, all of these things having nothing to do with any, anything that any person does. You're born to it. And one of the things about a caste system is that it's, it's, uh, you're born to it. It's, it's hereditary. You didn't choose to be either in the dominant group or the subordinated group. You're just born to wherever it happens to be the distinction in your society. Um, hierarchy such as this, a caste system, um, could use any number of metrics to divide and to rank people. You know, it could be, you know, in, in other systems, it could be religion, it could be a uh, place of origin where you're, where you're born, the language that you speak, the ethnicity that you're perceived as being part of, a, a number of things could be used as metrics to divide people. In our society, in the United States, you know, going back to the early, uh, early 17th century, uh, the, the framework for dividing people up was what we now know as race, which was uh, 
a creation and people talk about it being a being a, a social construct, but it was a creation of human beings who uh, were, you know, the colonists themselves who arrived at this land and decimated the numbers of, of indigenous people and then brought in people from, uh, from uh, Africa uh, to be enslaved and to build this, you know, the, this wilderness uh, into a country. And, uh, and, and, this, and in doing so, they determined who could be, uh, who could, who could uh, own property and who could be property. So, and that distinction was what we now know as race. So an entire group of people on the basis of what would be normally neutral characteristics that would be just a range of human manifestation, you know, what people look like, was then contorted and distorted into the metric that would be used to create a hierarchy that had not uh, existed in this way before, um, had not needed to exist anywhere where, uh, uh, like this before, and that became essentially our inheritance, you know, our inheritance of division and hierarchy that we live with to this day. You examine caste through the lens of three countries, um, yeah. the United States, India, and Germany. Um, as someone who spent several years in South Africa, that makes complete sense to me, but I think it may come as a surprise to some of your readers, and I'm wondering if you can tell us how you settled on these countries and, and did you consider others? It's so interesting that you bring up South Africa because some people will ask, you know, well, why don't you have South Africa in there? And of course I considered it as, as you probably know, I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was in South Africa for a short time covering it as, as you did for the New York Times. And so uh, I had a chance to experience what it was like to be there. And it was, it was an obvious, it's an obvious uh, country to look to to understand our own divisions because of the inversion of, of power dynamics with who is in the minority and who's not. Um, but uh, I settled on these three. Obviously, the United States was the main focus because this book uh, is primarily a book written by an American for Americans about America at a moment of existential crisis. That's essentially what it's about and who it's for. Um, but in order to better understand and make the case for the existence, enduring nature of a caste system in our country, I needed to look at places that, that have caste. And of course, India comes to mind first and foremost because it is the, the world's oldest caste system. It is, it is recognized as being um, a millennia old caste system that's very complex with thousands of of subcasts, four main casts, and then thousands underneath it. And so it's quite complex. And so that was one place I needed to understand for sure if I was going to, you know, try to see what the points of intersection would be in that country compared to ours. And then um, in the midst of all of that, of where I was, you know, really thinking this through and at the beginning stages of trying to figure out what it was going to be, then Charlottesville happened. And, you know, in Charlottesville, we saw you know, we saw um, the, uh, you know, these protesters who had uh, merged these two cultures that we don't want to think about as having anything in common with, you know, the Nazi Germany and the Confederacy. You know, we saw the symbols of both that these uh, protesters, as they were, they were protesting the potential removal of the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville, and they are the ones who made that connection. Even though many Americans might not see anything that they might have in common, those people in Charlottesville knew across, you know, across the oceans and across time, they saw a connection. And it was then that I started to think, well, maybe, you know, what is it that Germany could teach us? How is it that they had managed in the decades since the end of the war? Uh, what had they, um, you know, how do they, uh, have, how they atoned for it and reconciled that they had? I just, I needed to understand that. And so that's how we ended up with these, these three, the United States, um, India, of course, and then what could we learn from Nazi Germany? I want to say one other thing about Germany is that I had, you know, I truly had no idea. I mean, I was there to try to understand what could we learn from how they had dealt with their history? But then I discovered that there were so many parts of the history that we had in common with them. I mean, I had no I, idea. No, you're about I to say. I want to ask you about that. Yeah, you know, as as someone whose work now is is very much steeped in history, I am constantly 
confounded by how little I know about our history, how little I was taught. And one of the things that left me really uh, took me aback was how carefully the Nazi regime looked to the United States for inspiration, very specific inspiration. I had no idea. Um, I'm sure that many of our viewers here have no idea. I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I, I like you. I mean, I, I had no idea. I wasn't even really looking for that, to tell you the truth. As I said, I was looking to try to understand what had they done in the intervening decades. And uh, it was, you know, became really clear that, that uh, you know, that the Nazis, uh, in the years leading up to the Third Reich, uh, there had been these interconnections between these two countries. It turned out that uh, German eugenicists were in continuing dialogue with American eugenicists in the years leading up to the Third Reich. I mean, it's just stunning. It turned out that American eugenicists were writing these books that were huge, huge bestsellers in Germany in the years leading up to the Third Reich. In fact, they were so popular in Germany that the Nazis used these books in their own school curriculums for their children. I mean, that was that was how popular they were. American eugenicists, the, the books that they had written, and then it turned out that you know, of course, the the Nazis did not need anybody to teach them how to hate. They did not need the United States or anyone to teach them how to hate. But it turned out that they had uh, sent researchers to the United States to study the Jim Crow laws, to study the anti-miscegenation laws. They were really wanting to understand how had the United States managed to subjugate uh, African Americans in this country, and they were um, they were really interested in how the United States had devised ways to um, to uh, identify uh, and to, uh, you know, to to give an identity to people based on race. In other words, how do you identify a person and a person's race? How they defined race, and uh, they, they spent a lot of time looking at the, the, they were fascinated by the ways that the United States w may, m ended up creating fractions of quote unquote blood to, uh, to apportion and define who could be black, who could be white, who could be whichever other race they defined. Right, one, one, one thing that really struck me was uh, you mentioned that Hitler marveled at the American knack for maintaining an air of robust innocence in the wake of mass death. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And also that the one drop rule was too harsh for the Nazis. Yeah, it's just, um, they, um, they had a uh, belief, they actually debated this. I mean, it's stunning and chilling to think of them debating American jurisprudence uh, in the years leading up to what would ultimately become the Nuremberg Laws. Um, but in doing so, uh, they actually, came to the conclusion that um, one quarter to one half um, Aryan, in their view, blood w w needed to be protected in their view. And that, that was how that was their, that was how they uh, defined it. And, uh, and so they, they chose a different path than, than the United States. I wanna say one other thing, once you mentioned uh, South Africa, is that one reason why they turned to the United States is because it's hard for us to acknowledge and that's hard for us to even imagine, but um, at that time, in the early 20th century, the United States was the most advanced form of a racially based country, of a country whose laws were established to maintain racial hierarchy. And South Africa was not as far along actually as the United States was. I mean, we now think of South Africa, particularly 20th century, late 20th century history of South Africa. We think about that as the, as the framework for the worst possible uh, ways of looking at racial division. And yet uh, they were not as far along because apartheid, as you, as you know, did not become law until 1948. So the United States actually predated what um, South Africa would ultimately do. And that's one of the reasons why the Nazis looked to the United States. Well, you talk about the pillars of caste um, and um, to, to show, to illuminate how caste systems justify themselves and sustain themselves um, even into contemporary times. And, and you make it very clear that um, upper caste people, as you like to describe them, um, continue to benefit from the system, right, in the United States, even if they, you know, obviously they never personally owned slaves, they never supported 
uh, Jim Crow never endorsed uh, racism, racial violence. And I thought that was interesting, and I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that because some of the comments that um, we hear sometimes when we talk about uh, systemic racism, for instance, is, oh, not me, you know, not my parents, not my grandparents, um, not me, basically. And you use some very powerful metaphors to, I think, help people to understand how we all own this history. I'm, I'm hoping you can talk about that. I feel like your house is a character in this book and a one that I'd like to get to know. <laughs> but, but I think it's a powerful metaphor, your house, the American house. I'm just wondering if you can talk about how, um, how people continue to benefit from this system, even though it is less visible. And it's interesting you bring up the house because it's through housing that, that you, we can often see the, um, the long generations old um, after effects and shadow of, of, of hierarchy that, that we live with to this day. But um, as for the, the house metaphor to, to begin uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I was thinking about houses and I thought about how um, I present myself essentially as a building inspector who's presenting this report to everybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> Our house is in trouble. We need help. <laughs> we looked in all of the, the the dark recesses of the basement that no one wants to go into, you know, after, you know, house always needs work. An old house is the work is never done. You don't expect the work to be done. And this is an old house, you know, it's date, dating back from, you know, the 17th century. And, uh, you know, I, I say that, you know, you don't want to go in the basement after rain. Um, you just don't want to have to go in the basement uh, after rain. But if you don't go into the basement, it's not as if you're not going to have to deal with the consequences. You know, ignorance is no protection from the consequences of one's inaction. And so here we are, uh, the uh, the owners of the inheritors of a house that, you know, we no one alive built this house. No one alive has anything to do with the the une uneven pillars and joists and beams that may still be, uh, you know, uh, uh, deteriorating uh, that were askew perhaps from the very beginning. We we didn't build them, but anybody who is here now, as when you take possession of an old house, it's your responsibility going forward. You then take on the responsibilities of whatever happens. You didn't build it, you didn't create the problems, but it's your responsibility to deal with it when it's under your watch. And so that's why I, you know, I, I think that that's a way of allowing us to recognize that it's about a structure. It's not necessarily personal, but it has an impact that actually can even be a matter of life and death, as we, you know, saw um, in this past year. You know, with, uh, you know, we saw in May, you know, what happened to George Floyd, who, you know, who, you know, was killed before our very eyes. You know, no one to save him, no one to help him. Um, his humanity stripped away from him. He, the dehumanization being one of the pillars that that you were alluding to. And then we saw just a few, you know, a few, uh, you know, about a month ago, six weeks ago, um, a very different outcome for people who uh, were from a different, you know, positioning historically different quote unquote birthright uh, in our country and how, um, you know, he had been accused of merely having presumably uh, uh, tried to pass off uh, a twenty dollar counterfeit bill that was that was presumably the accusation against him, and we saw him killed before our very eyes. The people who you know who rampaged in in our in the capitol, you know the people who um, broke into the capitol, um, broke through police barricades and were you know trampling you know the uh, the statuary hall and the rotunda of the citadel of democracy, we saw those same people who had attacked police officers. They were, they walked free that day. I mean, people, you know, the authorities are trying to track them down, but that day they walked free and, and uh, they were not held to the same kind of account that, that the, the, you know, that, that occurred to, to George Floyd. So this is something that we, have we're dealing with to this very day. I wanted to just say one other thing about, you said the, um, the effect on people now, we may not recognize how the groups still live with the advantage, the, the, uh, the entitlements that we may not think about because one thing about caste in particular, like it's like the bones or the, 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 the joists and the beams that we can't see in that physical houses that we call home, 
you can't see it. So because you can't see it, you often don't realize how it's at work. And but one way that it's at, is at work for people of the current day is that right now, uh, African Americans, you know, the group that I describe as being the subordinated caste as opposed to the dominating caste, uh, is that those who were from the subordinated caste were uh, for generations um, excluded from the American dream, not not just made uh, you know not not just dis you know made uncomfortable, but but actually excluded from the American dream when it comes to home ownership. You know that that you know that there was there was redlining and restrictive covenants that were official policies that meant that African Americans, black people, were not permitted uh, government-backed mortgages, mortgages. They were disallowed from government-backed mortgages, which would become the basis of the American dream for you know for the majority of of, uh, of people in what I would call the dominating caste of white white Americans who they themselves had nothing to do with this with the the fact that they were born to a group that was uh, allowed to get government backed often low interest uh, loans to be able to buy homes they themselves may not have written those laws but they are the ones who benefited from laws that were you know racially uh, defined and uh, and in the guise of, of of apportioning again, as I said, you know, uh, resort access to resources that are kind of a hallmark of the hierarchy that we've inherited, and yet um, that that means that people. There was a quote that I saw um, in uh, in my research that indicated that any any white American. Um, who had had ancestors who were here in the United States and owned homes um, before 1968 materially and physically benefited from uh, from a, uh, a system that was set up to give entitlements to people on the basis of where they fit in the hierarchy due to no fault or action of their own. It's just what happened. And uh, meaning that this it didn't just happen on its own, I and mean, this was policy. But the people who were the beneficiaries of this um, benefit to this day because uh, even now um, African Americans have a wealth gap. There's a wealth gap in which white Americans have 10 times, and depending upon where we are with recession, at, at one point uh, the wealth gap was white uh, Americans having 19 times the wealth of their black counterparts. And this is the this is the consequence of decades and decades, generations of inequalities, in generations of inequities uh, that have been built into the framework of our country. And even now uh, we live with it. There was an estimate that said there's a study that found that this wealth gap has, is so massive that it will take another 228 years for for uh, for Black Americans to reach parity with White Americans, uh, White American families. So that that's how. There's, in there's often. Right, right, and there's often um, discomfort uh, with the notion of affirmative action in its modern incarnation. But of course, we had a, a racialized system that benefited one group for for most of our history, right? Um, one of the most powerful threads in your exploration of caste comes through your own personal experiences on, on airplanes and in, in restaurants, kind of um, this kind of the ordinary uh, late 20th century, early 21st century humiliations and indignities that our white counterparts don't have to experience, um, this constant questioning of credentials. Um, you say that some of these were drawn reluctantly from your experiences. I put reluctantly in quotes because it was what you used. Um, what made you decide to do that? And, and was it difficult to decide to do that? Well, I would still say reluctantly. I mean, it's not something, these are not um, experiences that I um, uh, enjoy speaking about um, even to this day. Um, there's re-traumatization every time you have to think about something that uh, you might have had to endure. And yet uh, I felt that this was one way that I certainly um, can say that if I'm trying to tell a story, 
Um, if I lived through it and you know took notes, because that's one of the things I do all the time is I constantly take notes. If I, I have that, that's something that is a resource that can be of some help in illuminating the situation for people. And the whole idea of being of what happened when I was uh, uh, in Chicago, just trying to write a basic, very basic story. And you know, I made these uh, appointments with all these people who were very excited to be in the New York Times. And often, often the case, people are are excited for some a story like this. They certainly would be. And uh, you know, I've gone through uh, the entire day and had no problems until it got to the end. I showed up at this one establishment a little early. Uh, the person I was to interview was not there yet, and the clerk said it was very empty time of the day. And the clerk just said, you know, have a seat and wait, wait. You'll be here momentarily. And this, the door opens and this man comes rushing in. He's very flustered. He's in a hurry. He's taking off his coat. I, and the, the clerk tells me that this is the person that I'm there to interview. I talked with him over the phone, but of course I hadn't met him. Uh, so I go over to him and I, you know, you know, to, to introduce myself. And he said, I, I don't have time to talk with you right now. I'm getting ready for a very important meeting. And I, and I, I said, well, you know, looking at the clock and knowing that he was already a little bit late, I realized that he very likely was talking about that I couldn't imagine that he unless he had two other uh, events and of course there's no one else there so it had to be this and I said well I think I, I think I'm your uh, I think I'm your appointment and he said no 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 it's with it's with the New York Times and I said well I am with the New York Times <laughs> I, I'm Isabel Wilkerson I've been questioning like where is your documentation where is your it's and I think many of us have had that experience um, uh, with that kind of like, is it you? Is it really you? Um, yeah. 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 He, he ended up um, he ended up uh, asking for ID. You know, he asked, asked for ID. I said I shouldn't have to give you ID. I mean, we had I talked with you on the phone. We had an appointment. You know, I have my note notebook here. We should be interviewing right now. And he, he said, Well, I like I need to see your ID. And then when I showed him the ID, I, it happened that I was out of business card, so you know, I showed him the ID. And he said, Well, you, he said uh, he, he said looking at the driver's license, you don't have anything with the New York Times on it. And uh, <laughs> And you know, I, I said to him, you know, we should be interviewing right now. This is a waste of time. You know, I've got I've got the piece to do. Don't you, you, he wants to be in the New York Times, right? Except for time. And he said, he said, well, I'm going to have to ask you to leave because she'll be here any minute. So <laughs> he left, and, and uh, you know, he clearly didn't make an end because I couldn't interview him. Did the story and, and you know, did what we have to do, but um, you know it's an example of one of the missed opportunities from his perspective too. It's an example of how these missed connections, these assumptions, um, the and, and out and out um, erasure really can affect people in ways that they may not even realize while it's happening because people are being are, are programmed to believe a certain thing, and if they're deeply invested in maintaining hierarchy. Um, without even necessarily being aware of it, but if they are, then this this is one of the consequences. He missed an opportunity, um, as as well as you know the the, the as well as I did. I, in fact, he probably his loss was greater because I was able to finish the book. The right. <laughs> right. How 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 do we confront this? How do we change this? Obviously, bringing this history, this information to light, is one way. You talk about not being able to move forward. Um, and you give again another metaphor of you know how you know how can you move forward if you uh, can't confront domestic violence you've witnessed as a child or alcoholism in families. But and and as journalists we obviously think about the power of information as a force for change. But but these days when I think about public memory, uh, I think about what we remember and what we choose to forget. And I, I wonder sometimes, is there a willfulness to our amnesia? Do people, do people, are people willing to hear? You, you talk about um, two models, perhaps. You look at, at Germany, you know, um, in terms of what they've done in, in grappling with their history. You talk about perhaps a need for a truth and reconciliation. Um, Commission, which of course brings to mind South Africa. And I think that both of those examples highlight opportunities, but maybe also highlight limitations, right? Um, there's uh, been a resurgence of far right extremism um, uh, in Germany. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in South Africa did give a voice 
to people, but it also kind of left the system Rachel, we can't How hear you. Try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm All not right. sure you, where you lost me. You were mentioning Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Okay. Um, which gave a voice to people, but also left that system, the economic system certainly in place. And I'm wondering, as we kind of wrap up, because we want to make sure we have time for questions, because so many people have questions, if you can talk about like how we move forward, what what can we glean from these these models, these ideas? What do we do? Um, and and does reparations play a part or not? Mm -hmm. Well, I completely agree that um, that uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process in South Africa. Um, clearly did leave um, so much wanting in the end, um, although it allowed for an airing of, of some of the, you know, some of the history, it, it, it did not resolve um, uh, the challenges as it, as it potentially could have. I would say that um, that there's th that is a big question, and I, you know, it's obviously I can't answer in in this moment. <laughs> but I will say that um, when it comes to Germany, uh, I find that while there are many things that they may not agree on, and it is they have many many challenges, as you as you rightly uh, alluded to, there's there's some things that they do basically agree on, and that is the basic facts of the history. And we have a long way to go before we can come to a, you know, a, a generally a common agreement about our country's basic history, a, an understanding of what Jim Crow truly was, an understanding of what enslavement truly was, an understanding of the connections between uh, the economic deprivations and the economic framework that created the world that we live in now. Um, I, I just think that we have a long way to go. On the other hand, you know, Germany, uh, they have, um, they've a approached their history very differently. I mean, in Berlin, a major world city, right in the middle of that, you know, major city is a massive, massive structure. And it is several football fields large. And what it is, is it's, a, it's the uh, memorial to those who perished in the Holocaust. And uh, it is, it's massive and, and uh, unavoidable in the, in the center of the city. One thing that's distinctive about it though is that there's no signage. There's no signage. There are not um, any, um, there's, there are not these, you know, uh, um, boards and, and exhibition uh, descriptors of what, of what it is because people learn the history. They know why it's there. There doesn't need to be a sign. They know exactly why it's there. Young people, uh, children, from as, as soon as they're able to begin to understand what happened in the war, they begin to learn it. They learn it all the way through school. Many of the places that have been controlled by, um, by the Third Reich have been converted into places of learning. Places of terror have become places of learning. Uh, they, they, uh, the, and the memorials that are there, whatever monuments you see, are only to those who suffered uh, under that regime or who resisted that regime. The people who were the oppressors in that, uh, in that terror, terrifying regime, there are no monuments or uh, symbols for, for them. And, and so that's a very different way of dealing with history. You know, even now when there are debates over what should happen with Confederate monuments, there are debates about how we should remember the history. When it comes to uh, truth and reconciliation, uh, you know, getting to South Africa, um, I believe that uh, that when we think about these two ways of looking at uh, our, you know, how our country might move forward, I think that one of the things that is consistent is the idea of learning the history and reconciling the history of finally confronting the history, getting on the same page. You know, when the Warmth of the Sons came out, one of the things that I would hear from people over and over and over again, that no matter the background, they would say, I had no idea. I had no idea this happened. I had no idea this happened in, in this country. I had no idea this happened in the part of the country that I'm from. I mean, people would say that all the time. And, and so not having an idea has consequences. It affects where people send their children to school, where they choose to live. 
you know, if they're in a position of granting mortgages or of hiring employees, it affects how they do that. I mean, it has an impact on our country. And so we need to get on the same page about how we got to where we are. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one that is done with all the seriousness and with purpose and depth and not something that's just rushed through to be able to check off a box, but to be able to truly engage with and go deep and make sure that all Americans know this history. That is something that really truly needs to happen. And you cannot, you can't reconcile what you do not know yet. That's why the truth is so important in the word truth and reconciliation. And you can't just leave it with the truth. You have to then reconcile it, I think, which is what we're talking about when you mentioned South Africa. I mean, it requires reconciling is a verb. It, it means to be active. Right. Yeah. It means active. Yeah. It means to be something. And you, yeah. so all of these things need to come together. And I would say that the United States, which, uh, you know, we, we, you know, it perceives itself as being a leader in the world, an innovator in, in technology, in, uh, in information and so many things. How, how amazing would it be were the United States to lead the way in a, in a meaningful, deep and effective truth and reconciliation approach which would of course naturally lead to an understanding of the need for reparations with an emphasis on repair. Because the idea of reparations is, the, is what happens in societies where you had an entire group of people who have been harmed. This is a group of people, speaking of African-Americans, uh, black people who have been harmed, had been harmed for so long, just to put in perspective what slavery was. Slavery went on for so long, it went on for 12 generations. 12 generations, how many greats do you have to add to the word grandparent to begin to imagine how long it went on? It went on for so long that it won't be until next year, 2022, that the United States will have been a free and independent nation for as long as slavery lasted on this soil. That's how long slavery lasted. And another way to look at it is that slavery went on for so long, it lasted for so long, that no adult alive today will be alive at the point at which African-Americans will have been free for as long as African Americans will have been enslaved, uh, were enslaved. That won't be until the year 2111. 2111 is when African Americans will have been free for as long as African Americans were enslaved. Okay, well, I want to say, I hate to stop you because I could talk forever with you, but we want to make sure that um, our many viewers have a chance um, to get their questions to you. So it's a pleasure, and um, I mean, can't wait to hear what people have to have to say and ask. I've so enjoyed it. Thank you both so much for um, such an illuminating conversation, brilliant and illuminating. Um, I the the questions box is just popping here tonight. Um, I'm going to start with the first one from Candice. Cast was incredible and indelible read, but the subject matter was so challenging at times that I found I had to read it in spurts. Read a few pages, reflect on the profundity of what you wrote, and then put it down for a while so that I could heal from the painful realities captured so movingly and steal myself for the next must read passage chapter. I have to say that was my experience too. I wonder how challenging it was for you to write given the sub subject matter? Well, uh, it, I hear that a lot. Um, um, I really do. Um, I have to say that when you work on something like this, uh, it's over the course of years, so that the experience that a reader gets of massive, like turn the page and oh my God, I cannot believe this, that, that kind of high concentration of a lot of material in a short space of time, um, that's not how I, you experience it when you're writing it. I mean, you're writing it and discovering these things over the course of you know months and years. And so I have the time, you know, in the process of writing and researching to be able to, you know, step away from it, take a break, and come back. So that that's why I think a reader is really getting a wall up of of intensity that is not the same when you're when you're writing it. <laughs> that said, though, this topic um, and th this both books, to tell you the truth. Um, have such um, some really deeply painful uh, truths and revelations that 
uh, that are, are hard to digest and, and hard to accept, quite frankly, as Americans and just as human beings. And uh, so I found myself, especially with the second book, uh, needing to uh, make use of things that I never really uh, do when I write. I mean, all of these years, I've never really turned to music. I never really, uh, I, if there are people who like to have music playing in the background of Mozart or jazz or whatever it may be. And I never was the type of person who, who needed that. Uh, but I found with this book, I, I really did um, turn to music to help uh, you know, help with the, uh, you know, with the, the subconscious absorption of all that I was having to, to, uh, uh, to uh, deal with. And so I turned to the music of Philip Glass, who it was this sort of propulsive, you know, modern classical music that was, was very helpful to me. Um, I even <laughs> would listen to uh, the um, Tibetan singing bowls that kind of can bring this kind of tranquil, Zen feeling to the moment. So I turned to a lot of things that I normally wouldn't uh, in order to get through it. But you know, one of the things that that I think propels people who do this kind of work, and and Rachel, I mean, I don't, I could, I can't speak for you, but I would imagine that this could be part of it too. Is that when you are making these discoveries, and you are in the midst of of being really being really deep into the work, and you are not, you you have still a ways to go. One of the things that propels you is you want to get this out to the world. You want other people to know about it. So one of the things that it does is it it, it forms a kind of, um, I don't say it immunizes you, but it is a form of protection because you are doing this for a purpose. You're not, you're not just looking at really difficult things just to be looking at difficult things. You are doing it because you want to get this out to the world and you want everybody to know what you've discovered. So that's one of the things that helps you through it as well. Um, thank you. Uh, as a follow-up question, Thyrita wants to know, how long did it take you to compile your research? Consequently, how long did it take to complete the books? The book, sorry. Hmm. Well, I, I'm getting a little better because The Warmth of the Sun took me 15 years, so I often say if it, were, if it were human being, it would be in high school and dating. That's how long that book took me. So, so I'm getting better. This was this was just under 10 years, you might say. I'd say the the genesis of this book, in a serious way, was the uh, was uh, was what happened to Trayvon Martin. Um, you know, what happened to him was what I would say the beginning of what ultimately was going to become. Black Lives Matter. Um, it was one of the first big cases that became uh, a case of the uh, that, that was uh, became um, uh, focus of social media. You know, was spread and and exposed to the world through social media. We all experienced, many many people experienced at the same time, the sense of of shock at the at the um, the conclusion of that trial, you know, the whole thing just sort of unfolded on social media, and so it was after that case that I, you know, began to really think about, you know, it wasn't fully formed yet, but the idea that this term that had been used in the Warm Brother Sons had something to tell us about what we were seeing, and I I ended up writing an op-ed for the New York Times where I was making this connection between what happened with Trayvon Martin and how these racial hierarchies um, can be visible to us in moments like that. Because here was someone, something where race alone didn't explain it because George Zimmerman was actually of, of Latinx uh, descent. And so, you know, the general thinking about black and white racism would not be, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't figuring there, it wasn't, it wasn't as obvious there. And so uh, what I ended up doing was I ended up uh, writing something that would try to explain how caste could help us to see that these graded artificial rankings of human value um, would allow us to see how something like this could happen. Uh, and, and so that's how I got started with the, the process of thinking it through. So that was 2012 and then the book came out and. 2020. So there you there you go. <laughs> there are so many great questions here. It's hard to choose. Um, here's one from Eileen. In a previous interview, I heard you talk about the way the word cast with 
without the E and how it suggests that we play a role in society and that no one wants to deviate from their assigned role and risk upsetting the way society works. We believe that it's necessary to be a disruptor in order to bring to people's attention that the roles of American cast members must be changed in order to heal, begin to heal our society. Well, I really appreciate um, I really appreciate bringing up that uh, that um, analogy. Uh, what I'd say is that cast allows us to see um, how these interconnected uh, behaviors and systems are playing themselves out uh, before us. And so I think that the word cast without the E helps us to uh, see how cast is distinctive in that it keeps us in a fixed place. It keeps people in a fixed place. So cast without an E, uh, you know, we think about the mechanism that goes on an arm that keeps the fractured bones in place, cast to keep bones uh, stable and connected and fixed. So they're immobile, so that they're there and fixed. Uh, when you think about cast as it, it applies to a play uh, and the members of the, the people in the play, actors. Um, so you think about how there is a stage and there's someone stage right and stage left and in the foreground and the background. And everyone on that stage has lines to speak and they know what their lines are. They know when someone else moves from their place to another part of the stage, what's supposed to happen next. And when people are really invested and really deeply, they really know the play. They know not only their lines, but they know everyone else's lines. They know the entire play. Everyone knows the entire script. And so in that respect, when you think about if, you know, how a, a cast is a, is a, is a, a hierarchy of graded value and roles that are assigned to people going back to the time of enslavement again those who could own property and those who were property that speaks to the ways that, in which people make assumptions and hold stereotypes unconscious biases as to who belongs where who should be doing what uh, who should be in which roles who should be in which kind of positions those are the kind of things that we've inherited and the idea of caste without the e allows us to see how it could be at work and how I describe, you know, casteism as, as a term is, is means essentially that you have an investment, a person could have an investment in maintaining uh, the, the hierarchy, maintaining these divisions, maintaining uh, a caste system. And that doesn't require that you hate anybody. It just means that you are accustomed to, you've been programmed to, uh, to believe and to hold these assumptions and biases and unconscious uh, assumptions, and that you have an investment, whether, whether you're conscious of it uh, or not, in maintaining it, which is one of the reasons we saw this spate of people in what I would call the dominating caste uh, intruding into the lives of ordinary people um, and from a quote unquote subordinated caste as they were going about their day barbecuing uh, at a park in Oakland or at a Starbucks in Philadelphia and someone comes in and believes them to be out of their place and calls the police on them. And, and that is, you know, that is a, a manifestation. It's sort of a, a, a very easy to recognize manifestation of this phenomenon of caste. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I guess I think this, again, it's really hard to choose from so many great questions, but I don't always feel that way. But um, although I will admit we have a great audience, there's no <laughs> doubt. Um, this is Trisha Ann. How do you suggest talking to young children about the caste system? That is a really tough one because, you know, it, first of all, I often say people, people often ask, you know, what can I as a parent do? What can I do? What I can do? The first thing a parent can do is to educate oneself. The first thing teachers can do is educate themselves. The first thing that people can do is to first learn the history. There is no um, there's no 10 point plan that can fix it. There's no, you know, there's no set of, uh, you know, of of uh, a checklist of what we can do because it's so massive. It is so massive and it involves all systems in our country, you know, education, um, labor, criminal justice system, you know, mass incarceration. It involves all of these systems. And so I, I would first of all say that, um, that uh, I often say that 
what we have to do beyond just trying to learn what the points might be of fixing it is to first know the history. And I think not enough of us know the history. So I would I would say, first of all, in order to be a great teacher, one has to first know what it is that they're teaching. And so that, that's one of the things I would suggest to, to all adults and, and to parents as well. Some of this is very, very difficult history. I mean, it's very difficult. And the, the book, as you know, has some really tough aspects to it. So I think that what I would first be suggesting is that we as adults check ourselves and, and learn ourselves and then be able to be good um, you know, because children learn through it, through uh, observing behavior of others, you know, being good examples of being uh, of, of fighting against uh, uh, assumptions and stereotypes, being being the type of people who can be uh, checking ourselves for uh, biases that are natural to human beings and that we've all been exposed to these things. That's what I, that's what I think, because I think talking about it is not sufficient. We have to be modeling what we say we want our children to do. Right. Um, there are a lot of questions here about what uh, white people can do. Blacks can raise awareness, but it seems to me that if change is going to happen, this is Carolyn, that it's whites that have to change behaviors. How can you see that happening? How can we make that happen? I, you know, I keep going back to uh, to education because, and, and when I say education, I mean with a big E. Uh, I mean, we we need new textbooks. You know, we need it, it, the, the kinds of things that uh, that we're talking about here should not be new to any American. The whole this whole idea of what you know what's happened in recent years and particularly in recent months in our country, the people who would say, you know, I had, you know, I, I did not, you know, this is not my country. I don't recognize my country. This is not what our country stands for. This is not what America stands for. Well that's an indication that that people don't know the history. People do not know the true history of our country because this is what the United States has been like more often than it has not. And that's why I keep calling for it. We need to know our country's history so that we are, we would not be surprised by the things that continue to happen. And more importantly, we would be in a posi better position to begin to uh, to create uh, ways of fighting against this so that they don't continue to happen. I mean, we can't continue to go on. I mean, one of the reasons that, one of the things that I say about this is that if, you know, when it comes to, uh, if we think about our country as a, as a patient, you know, a patient that is, that has heart disease, you're not surprised if the per if the patient has a heart attack, you should never be surprised if they had a heart attack. You can be jarred and and worried, obviously, about it, but you're not you're not surprised by it because there is a pre-existing, long-standing condition that almost could predict some of what we have seen. And so I would love it if we could if we could uh, if we could get uh, if we could recognize that this is part of this is part of our country's history. This is actually who we are. And once we find out who we are, then we can be on the road to making this country who we, who and what we wish it to be. But we have a long way before we do that. Uh, the responsibility uh, falls more heavily on those who have been the prime beneficiaries of the caste system from the beginning and who continue to be the prime beneficiaries of the nation's hierarchy. Um, yes, the responsibility is the, the, the greater the, uh, the uh, the benefit, the greater the responsibility. It's not up to those who have been from the subordinated group to be the ones to fix what it, what they did not create. And that's why I think it's important for everyone to recognize how this is actually harming everybody. You know, we have, you know, one of the things that's in the book is I make reference to this, uh, this video that, uh, that was out of the UK. And in this video, uh, uh, people, Londoners were asked a question try to guess how much it costs in the United States for an American to get the following service. And uh, they were being asked about the American uh, health system. And time and time again, when people were asked how much does it cost, this one woman was asked how much do you think it costs to have a C-section, to have a baby in the United States. And she, they were always off. I mean, she might have guessed $500 or something that we would just laugh at. And when she was told the amount, she said, to have a baby, thousands of dollars to have a baby, she just could, she just simply couldn't believe it. Another person was asked 
uh, how much do you think it costs for an American to um, have an ambulance take them from their home to the hospital for an emergency? And he said, they charge for that? There's a fee? just to, to take you to the hospital when you need to go to the hospital. They simply couldn't conceive of what Americans take as just a, a, you know, as one of the facts of life that we have to find ways to manage around. And so this is an example of how we are all being hurt by a caste system, even though we may not recognize it. And I think that the more Americans recognize the, the cost, that the price that we all pay, the fact that everyone suffers in a caste system. Of course, if you are the target of the caste system, you are, you know, suffering, um, you know, many, many times more. But everyone, no one, there are no winners really in a, in a caste system. Even those who perceive themselves uh, uh, themselves as as winning are actually not, because the price is too high. The price is too high for the inequalities that we have to live with, and the violence that's part of maintaining a caste system. Very, very violent. We have. We have in this country, this country has more guns than any other country um, in, in the world. And um, this is, you know, and, and more importantly, we have more guns than our um, member parallel nations, de developed nations in the world. And, and therefore, there's something, something deeply, deeply disturbing about that fact that it, there's this, you know, there, it's, there's violence that has been part of maintaining a caste system. And we live with the after effects of that when we realize how how much uh, gun ownership is a is a major feature. Again, this is not a commentary on the Second Amendment. It's just a fact of what of what the country has compared um, to our nations. I have a whole cluster of um, comments from our audience who are enraged and infuriated by what happened to you in that department store. Well, and. <laughs> And here's my favorite one. This is from Sandy. Whoever did not get interviewed did not deserve to be interviewed. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but uh, here's one that's sort of harkening back to the health system. And I think it's really important. This is from Catherine, another Catherine. In what ways does the impact and response to the pandemic reflect caste? Yeah, well, one of the one of the uh, hallmarks of caste, what I call the pillars of caste, is occupational hierarchy. That's truly one of the uh, identifying characteristics in India, where people were are born to historically had been born to very specific work tasks of st being street sweeper, uh, being a priest, whatever it might have been. And uh, we did not have that level clearly of, of specificity and, and uh, intricacy, but we do have essentially one in which an entire group of people for the majority of time that there's been in the United States and even before there was the United States were consigned to, the, to either being working on uh, farm work as enslaved people or as as servants as as enslaved people. In other words, either into the 20th century iteration, the more recent times, uh, meaning uh, farm workers, sharecroppers, or domestics. Those were that that accounted for a good portion of all uh, black workers well into the 1940s, uh, and in some ways uh, became part of the uh, was the recognition of how significant that was as a role that African Americans were consigned to was one of the reasons why in creating this, the social security system um, that uh, people who were, uh, people, the, the kinds of work that black people did were specifically excluded from uh, from eligibility for social security, meaning people who did farm work, farm uh, who, sharecroppers and domestics were specifically excluded uh, from uh, from being able to participate in the social security system. And so that is one of the ways in which we, you know, are, we can see this uh, playing out. So that even now, you know, with COVID, you know, particularly in the first, uh, you know, weeks and months of, of, the, of the pandemic, we could see that there were people who were deemed as essential workers, those who were the bus drivers and the, uh, the people who were stacking shelves at a at a uh, 
supermarket, those who were delivering goods to people who had the luxury of self sheltering in place were more likely to be black and brown people. People who would then be more exposed to the virus uh, in the early days when we didn't even know about, we didn't have access to masks, I mean, the early days in particular. And then th they were more likely uh, to not only contract the virus, but also more likely to be truly sickened by the virus and then to to often die as a result of their exposure to the, the virus. And in addition to that, the fact that they were doing jobs which as their ancestors might have were not covered by health insurance so they therefore did not have access to health care that other americans might have they were less likely to have access to it and even once if they did they were entering a health care system that study after study after study has found is riven with unconscious biases uh, to such a degree that uh, a good portion of medical students uh, with one of several of the studies have found that, that medical professionals are more likely to believe the fiction that, um, that black and brown people do not experience pain at the same level as their white counterparts, that this is something that is a challenge to this day, right now. Um, people who are being treated by those in the, uh, in the uh, healthcare system, entering a system where uh, a, a good portion of the people working in that system still harbor these, these unsupported, unsustained, uh, actually false uh, stereotypes and biases. So these are the things that people were up against that we have seen risen up um, in, in COVID-19. And I have to, to mention this because it's so, uh, so shocking. Uh, it's so jarring and sad uh, to me, but also reflective of, of caste is what happened to uh, a, a black woman physician in, in Indianapolis uh, in December. Her name was, was Dr. Susan Moore, and she was a physician who was fully aware of, of not just the symptoms for COVID, but also of the procedures and the, uh, the protocols for dealing with people who had COVID. She was in the hospital and she was not getting the protocols that she knew were necessary for someone, a patient such as herself. She was being denied treatment, being denied uh, pain medication, and she was reduced to having to take a video of herself to let you know, her, her loved ones know what she was enduring and what she was being denied. As a physician herself, here was someone who had, you know, access to not just education, but to medical knowledge and, and expertise, and she was denied basic treatment. And that video was taken, it was, you know, it went, it went viral, and she, she died uh, within uh, 48 hours of having recorded that video. Um, just st stunning to see. So these are, you know, cast as I'm describing in here as a matter of life and death. And that's why it's so important that we address it and reconcile it and, and begin to really deal with what we've inherited as a country. Now, um, it's hard to even speak after hearing that because it's so painful, but I'm going to ask this question. This is from Leslie. And it follows up on the idea that it's white people's job to make a difference because white supremacy is upheld by white people for the benefit of white people. So the question is, what is the most effective way for someone in the dominant caste to be an ally of a lower caste uh, on a group or an individual level? Like, what do we do? And and you, you talk about this in your book, and I felt very sad when I read it that there was a woman who was trying to be an ally to you and in a restaurant where you were re receiving very poor treatment, and she wound up yelling at a, a Black woman who was the, um, the manager of the restaurant. So what do you do? This shows you how complicated it is. I mean, it's very, very complicated and you can't anticipate what is going to happen because it just unfolds before your very eyes. Um, you know, again, this is this is something for, first of all, one thing is I'm really careful about language. There are times when I use the term upper caste and lower caste, but for the most part, it's, sub it's subordinated caste. 
and dominant cast. That's really important because these are all manufactured positionings in a hierarchy. And I would, I really am, did not, was, was not seeking to uh, give the impression of affirming that one group is actually lowest and another group is upper. I'm really careful, of, I try to be careful about that language. And that's one of the things that I would like to, you know, to emphasize as we talk about this. I want people to talk about it. I'm thrilled that people are talking about it. But in India as well, I mean, there's a real sensitivity to the use of the term. They used to term, use, in the past, they used upper caste and lower caste, and in, in fact, UC and LC. Um, and now it's really trying to recognize that it's dominant caste and dominating, because that, again, focuses on the verb of action, of being dominant, acting dominant, asserting dominance. Um, versus being subjugated because it takes action. That's another reason that we use the term enslaved as opposed to slave now, because it's an awareness that the, the people are born free and they are made into enslaved people. They are made into slaves. They're not born slaves and this is not, that was not their only identity. Um, they were human beings who were enslaved. And so this is just one thing I would mention as well. But you know th that's a really big question with very little time to answer it. And also, I would say that people in what born to the historically subordinated caste are not the ones to. We bear enough burdens than to have to be um, fixing other groups. So there, there's enough that that the people in this in this group that I'm part of have to deal with. And so we we cannot be expected to have all the answers. What I would say, though, is that people who are born to, uh, you know, the, a group that has been uh, the dominating group in our country's history, uh, one of the things that, that, that people can do is to listen, really, really to listen, to allow themselves to step back and not to need to be the ones to uh, be in the spotlight, to allow people who've been in the margins pushed to the margins for most of our country's history to be able to be the ones to, uh, ex you know, to share their experiences, to be heard for what they are going through, uh, to be consulted as decisions are being made, uh, to be recognized for the wisdom that the ancestors had to have had in order for us to survive. Because for people to have survived for 12 generations of, of uh, brutal, um, legal, uh, 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 repression uh, known as enslavement followed by nearly 100 years of Jim Crow, the, the people uh, have a deep wisdom and, and, a, and a deep understanding uh, of what, of, of in, in their bones of what's happened in this country. And so that's one of the things that I would say is, is to listen. Uh, there's a lot that could be said, uh, but I would, I would probably say of all the things that could be done, it would be to listen. I do make mention in the book of, of this idea of radical empathy. Uh, the you know, a caste system is happening on multiple levels of the structures of our country. And it will take everyone to work together to first recognize what we're dealing with, um, begin to know what has happened in order to diagnose what has happened in order to repair what has happened. Then in the meantime, this idea of radical empathy, which is not a lot, the, 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 I'm not suggesting that that's an answer, but it's one of the things that each individual can do at, you know, starting at this very moment. And radical empathy is not just, is not just trying to imagine someone, imagining yourself in someone else's shoes. That's really kind of like role playing. That's not what true deep empathy is. Empathy, radical empathy, is allowing yourself to feel the pain of another person, allowing yourself to have the humility to listen to the experiences of someone who might be presumably very different from you, or you've been told is different from you, and to allow yourself to experience what they have actually experienced, not from and, and not to think about what you might do in a position or situation that you've never been in and never will be in, but to try to imagine, based upon knowledge and humility, what another person's experience has been so that you can begin to understand why and how they do the things that they're doing. And that, that is why I describe radical empathy, listening and humility as the, you know, as the beginning of the work of being an ally in, in the situation that we find ourselves in in this country. Um, thank you for that. Uh, 
I there's I'm gonna, I want to ask one more question. I want to ask one more question. It's actually from two different people. Both of them want to know about reparations, and uh, one of them also wants you to know is this is Janine that your book has transformed her life, and she thanks you for all your exemplary work. And she wants to know: Do you think black people would still be in this situation? And then if we had reparations, and then another. Lori, who works with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, which is pa pushing for the passage of pending legislation to establish a reparations task force. And um, she says, where do you see reparations as fitting into the picture for undoing the devastating structure of caste structural racism? Well, reparations alone um, is, is would not undo the structures. I mean, the reparations is is an, an ethical, moral, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, make his attempt to make right for what ha was taken from the generations of people who are descended from slavery, from enslavement, which is a standard, uh, you know, throughout not just our country, but in other countries for groups that have been harmed. So that that is that is uh, totally separate from what needs to happen to address the structural inequalities in our society. That is that is essentially what has been due due because of the uh, the injustices, the economic uh, inequalities, and exclusion from the uh, from economic life in this country. That that's what reparations is. What uh, what I would say is that reparations, however, in my view, would need to come along with education because I think that you know we we're now in what people call a, a third reconstruction, where we had the original reconstruction uh, after the Civil War, uh, in which you know uh, there was a very short window of time, ten or twelve years, of an attempt to. Uh, be able to establish and help people get established after the end of slavery. Interestingly enough, the people who received uh, reparations or uh, remuneration were those who, who had been enslavers for what they presumably had lost in the, uh, at the end of, the, of slavery, meaning that they, they lost their inventory and they were they were if there was any payment that occurred it was to those who presumably lost quote unquote inventory so the people who had been uh, enslaved for 12 generations whose labors helped to build the wealth of our country and the wealth of the people who presumably owned them received nothing they received nothing and then they were expected to just start from scratch when actually they were behind because they were had been with they had been held back for so long not permitted to uh, to get to, to learn to read and to write and they're just it's, it's it's unbelievable that this was even allowed to happen in our country but then of course the reconstruction of the 1960s where many people would have felt that that took care of everything we had the civil rights legislation of 65 64 65 and 68 and here we see that 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 the legislation alone had not been enough and of course uh how fragile democracy is because the voting rights act has been uh, under assault in the time since then and we can see you know uh we can see the efforts at continuing voter suppression in you know happening right before our eyes right now so so this is something that needs to be continually uh, uh a sense of hyper vigilance uh continually uh fought for and and uh, and like that old house, uh, the work is never done and we should never be assuming that we can declare the work over. It requires a constant awareness. And I keep mentioning these references to uh, a, an illness or some type of uh, you know health condition. When you have certain health conditions uh, or certain things that might run in a family, you, you don't assume, if, for example, if alcoholism runs in a family or diabetes runs in a family, you don't assume that I, you will do one thing and it's taken care of. You know that this is a lifelong challenge. You can never assume that you, you can just take you pass this law or you can uh, make this decision and then you're all good. You know, we know that with health conditions of human beings, well, what about the body politic of our country? And so I think that you know what this calls for is a recognition of the hard work that is required in order to first uh, 
uh, in, it, to first to correct that which has happened before us, and then to begin to build on that so that hopefully these things would not happen again, so that we will have learned from, from our past. You know, we, you cannot learn from a past if you don't know the past. And that's why I keep going back to, to knowing it. What an honor and a privilege it has been to hear you speak and uh, to talk to you about these crucially important issues. Um, I know that uh, your time is limited, and um, I, I just want to thank both of you, um, both such distinguished and uh, brilliant journalists for and writers and thinkers for sharing uh, your thoughts and your wisdom with us. Um, and I want to thank the audience also, because as I always say, without you, we have nothing. And um, I just want to, this is my moment where I remind everybody that if you really love an author, if you really care about their ideas, buy their books and support them. And that way they keep coming back to our programs, they keep being able to write books, and they keep being able to get the recompense that they deserve. At the library, we're all about giving it away, but if you really love an author, you'll support them by buying their books. You can borrow this book cast from the Montclair Public Library, or you can buy it from our uh, local independent booksellers and partner, Watch on Booksellers. Um, and then finally, we hope that you all join us for our next event with uh, best-selling author and journalist Gabrielle Glazer, who will be in conversation with uh, author Benilda Little about Gabrielle's new book, American Baby, a Mother, a Child, and the Shadow History of American Adoption on Sunday, February 28th at 4 p.m. Thank you again, ladies. Be well, and we'll see you all next time. Bye for now.